So if you could see inside the heart of God, what do you think you would find? Do you think there would be people, places, situations, maybe rituals, saints, movements, or particular texts? It's not a question I've thought about too much, at least not when worded in this particular way. But it is something that has come to my mind lately, especially when it comes to naming this present moment that we are in as American Christians, a moment of reckoning with our harmful past and trying to forge a way forward to a brighter and more just future. It is a moment of unveiling, a moment of unmasking, a moment of unlearning, and a moment of restructuring. And so often when I need inspiration, it's helpful to return back to a story that is familiar. And so we reflect today on a story that you have likely heard before, except this time, not so much focused on a burning bush, but the heart of God and revolution. It's the story of a young shepherd boy named Moses and his call to leading his people to freedom. We first find him in a desolate place. He's a little insecure, a little sorry for himself and a bit rough around the edges. Before this encounter, we had already watched him become estranged from his family, wrestle with his identity and even allow his anger to get the best of him. But still in this moment, it is this uncertain shepherd boy that has a divine encounter that would change the course of his life and his entire community. It is in this place that God comes to meet him, not to create a new ritual or hymn, not to lay out new laws for the land, but God meets him to give him a glimpse into God's own heart. Often when the story is told, it makes God seem really big and macho. We may be used to an Exodus story that has been depicted in several movies and screen. They are often focused on action and conquering and quick movement and even silly characters. And yet when I hear the same story today, I am struck not by God's dominance, but by God's softness. One of the most unique and striking elements of this passage is God's awareness of pain and suffering. Because in other stories where God raises up a leader, the text will tend to use militaristic language or judgment language. But in this account, God says something that God never says in any other place. God says, I know their sufferings. In Hebrew, this is not simply an observance, but an intimate and experiential kind of knowing, which is why one scholar said that God has so internally entered into the suffering as to have deeply felt what they are having to endure, and their pain becomes God's pain. So it's not only a feeling, but also a position and orientation. And so in saying, I know their sufferings, the word know is the same word that is used to describe the intimacy that comes from sexual relations, to know something, to actually experience it and put it on. That's the kind of intimacy that God is communicating. And it's clear that God is in this case, taking the side of the oppressed God will not be indifferent to what God's people are experiencing. And the knowing that God is experiencing makes God willing to intervene, even within the social political arena. And so here God invites Moses to both feel God's heart and then rise to become part of an emerging liberation movement, one that would change everything 
forever. Throughout my spiritual journey, I have been exposed to many different versions of Christianity. I have worshiped in small churches of up to 10 people, large, church, large churches with hundreds and thousands of people. I have sung songs in church basements, in home basements, in tents, on heights, and in school classrooms. I have listened to liturgies. I have shouted and been caught in the spirit. I have worshiped with white Christians and black Christians, and I have clapped along to worship in countries where I did not even understand the words that were being said. And yet one of the things that nearly all my experiences had in common was the separation from myself as someone who was black. Particularly in spaces that were majority white, I can remember faith being talked about as something abstract and invisible. Preachers and mentors would say things like, we needed to have a personal relationship with God, but one that was separate from others. And they would teach that our deepest need was freedom from individual sins like lying, gossip, or greed. And then that led to our greatest hope, which is the thing that we should work towards, which is going to heaven after we die. And at the time, many of these beliefs brought me great joy. I was dedicated, that, dedicated to them and wanted more than anything to live a life that was pleasing to God. However, I quickly realized that these interpretations of scripture particularly ones that privilege the soul over the body, the individual over community, the invisible over the material and heaven over earth have led to some of the most horrific atrocities in human history. And early on, I was able to see many of the consequences of these beliefs play out before my very eyes. As a youth, I was often in faith spaces where I felt erased. Many times it would be subtle. People did not talk about race. And when they did, it was to say that we should all just be colorblind because everybody is exactly the same. They'd say things like, there's only one race, the human race, or God doesn't see color. And in these kinds of circles, talking about race meant that you were stirring up trouble, being superficial, or even that you were less spiritually mature. But on the other hand, there were also some Christians who sought me out specifically because I was black. But this was because they wanted to be able to say that they were in relationship with me, but they did not actually want to be changed by my lived experiences. Last week, our guest preacher, Juliana, spoke powerfully about how sometimes we want to capture people and many times add to our number and add to our diversity rather than truly listening and being captivated by their stories. And so that this meant that even though some people appeared to love me or even want me around, it was often on their own terms. And so naturally then I was welcomed, but was generally expected to look and act like everybody else. I was most praised when I spoke with certain vocabulary or dressed or behaved in a way that others felt was proper or acceptable. And people seemed to be happy that I was not like those others that they would see on the news or in the bad parts of town. And essentially they wanted to kill the parts of me that made me, me. Because at the end of the day, what was constantly being reinforced was that who I was and the people I came from was subpar, something to be overcome and overshadowed by what others considered normal. And I didn't really realize it at the time, but these were experiences that made me feel shame in who I was and begin to experience a mistrust or even uneasiness around my own people. But my life took a monumental turn when I finally learned about this thing called Black 
liberation theology in seminary. It was my first introduction to this idea that not every group and not every culture has historically read scripture through the same lenses. It was like drinking water after wandering around in a desert. I do not think it's an understatement to say that it actually saved my life. Black liberation theology was officially coined in the 1960s by James Cone. You probably have heard Peter talk about him. <laughs> Though the movement could be traced back to slavery, his formalized writings rose out of the civil rights and black power movement. It was also out of his personal frustrations that many white Christians around him were silent as many racial injustices were regularly being exposed. And so in response, James Cone and other theologians like him began to publish these creative and generative new ways to read scripture and articulate Christian faith. If I could sum up his books in one sentence, I would say, that according to Cohn, any message that is indifferent towards the social and political conditions of oppressed people, and in America specifically Black people, cannot be the true gospel. And the thing about this type of theology is that much of it is built on the story of Exodus the story of God deeply identifying with the enslaved Hebrew people and then freeing them from their captivity through Moses, the young shepherd boy. But using this story wasn't something that Cohn invented. Many enslaved people years before him had also latched onto the story. While white Christians during this time were often justifying their crimes through scripture, Enslaved people would read the story of the Exodus where God says, let my people go and be inspired by its promise of deliverance. I mean, they would sneak off when their masters weren't looking and tell one another their own stories and interpretations. They would sneak off and tell each other the promise that laid in the story of Moses. Sometimes they would sing songs and spirituals to encourage one another as they were suffering. They'd sing lyrics like, go down Moses, way down in Egypt's land, tell old Pharaoh to let my people go. Or other times to be much safer, they'd use coded words and coded images in order to signal to one another their dreams of freedom, or plans for escape. Good news, the chariot is coming, they'd sing, or God's gonna trouble the water. Some would even read this Exodus story and stage their own revolts against their masters based upon it. And during enslavement, the book of Exodus was even ripped out of some Bibles or hidden because those in power did not want to lose their grip. But still, people like Harriet Tubman, who focused on helping people escape to freedom, were often compared to Moses. And so that story still stuck. When I was in school, it was common for people to be uncomfortable with this type of theology. It was often very indicting and at times hard to hear. They would often say things like, this is just taking things too far, or this reading of scripture is way too particular. They would say things like, that's cool and interesting, but when are we gonna get to real theology? See, because for them, they were much more interested in debating the text. So, when it came to Exodus, they wanted to know things like, is this a real historical story? Is an event like this where people are crossing the Red Sea and it opens for them, is that scientifically possible? Or should the story be understood literally or metaphorically? Do we have archeology span to back up what it's saying? 
But the thing is, for Black theologians during this time, these kinds of questions were irrelevant and distracting. They did not read scripture for historical accuracy. They read it to be moved emotionally and then as a call to action. The questions they asked were, what kind of God is depicted here and how should we respond? And more than that, my colleague simply could not understand that reading Cohn's work was one of the first times that I actually saw myself in scripture. It was the first time I felt like God saw the parts of me that so many others had tried to ignore or silence or put into a box. And not only that, but I could then imagine a God who looked like me and was moved by what people were experiencing in the world. A God who grieved with me, a God who experienced outrage, a God who was focused not just on my sin, but on my dignity. That's exactly what I needed. A God who was moved by what all suffering communities experienced. Because the God of Exodus doesn't stand idly by while people are humiliated and brutalized. The God of Exodus was not only concerned with invisible affairs, the God of Exodus was particular. I know their suffering. I see what is being done to them. And the God of Exodus chooses sides. The God of Exodus challenges the pharaohs of the world, stood against white supremacy and racism, stood against slavery and Jim Crow, and now stands against police brutality and the criminal punishment system and inequities and healthcare and housing and schools and churches because the God of Exodus is not frozen in time, but is continuing to look into human history and say, let my people go over and over again. Let my people go. It has been the battle cry of the ages. What I hope that you are reminded of today is that while Christianity has been a bloody religion, a religion that has been used to ignore and justify all kinds of racism and other, ra other isms throughout history, a religion whose sacred texts have been used to say that people should simply stay in line and obey their masters, a religion who whose sacred texts have also been used to keep people unaware and uninvolved in a struggle for liberation because faith is really not supposed to be about those kinds of things. And yet black history declares that there is always more than one way to read a text, to use a faith, to use a tradition. Since Cone, there are now more kinds of liberation theology than I can even count. His was heavily influenced by Latin America, but now there is theological literature by and for almost every marginalized group. Women, queer folks, indigenous, Palestinian, the disabled community, and more. And I think the encouragement is that God is just big enough to be for each of these communities what they need, and each of these communities deserves to be able to see themselves in the holy and sacred. And perhaps this is the beauty of scripture, that it is not meant to be dead and stagnant. It is not locked in time with nothing to say to us today. No, scripture is alive and active. It's a living document, which means it invites our creative engagement, our questions, our rage, our lament, our reworkings of the text. Through things like Black liberation theology, we are reminded that God's glory is often revealed through our human particularities and our context. Always new truths to be revealed, fresh waters to be washed in daily. And we are reminded too of the brilliance that can transform harm into healing because the violence of the world has been matched by revolutions, often inspired by holy stories. 
And so then Black history is one long story about people who refuse to stay down. And so I invite you now to think about your own experiences. How does Black history and all of this talk of theology move you? Where are some places where harm has happened? Where are the places where that harm can be transformed? Where does creativity call you? Where is it that new stories can spring forth and new interpretations can be soothing? In what ways is God rising against evil around you? And in what ways may God be calling you from your own burning bush to be part of that transformation? Because once we join our voices and our bodies to the choir of people throughout history saying, let my people go, we will do more than just improve lives. We just may discover the heart of God. So let it be so. Amen. And so now I'd love to hear how this is moving in you. Um, I was telling Brooke the other day about, about this, but, um, I, every day I've been like journaling in the mornings and then I write, like, I'll, I'll read like a verse of the day and then I'll write it down and then I'll like see how it speaks to me. And the past couple of days I've read the verse of the day and it just brings me like, I just feel like angry <laughs> because a lot of the times, like when I read it, it takes me back to like a, a church service I was a part of where like the pastor would read that verse and it would be for like, it would just be in hate and it would be to come at like a group of people or a situation. And I struggle with that a lot now because I grew up really conservative and pretty much like three years ago, two years ago, I kind of went through like a deconstruction of my faith and I'm still going through that. And um, so when you were talking about like just interpreting the text and how it can be used for good or bad, depending on like what you believe. And that's just, it's just nice to know that like, I was talking to Sam about this too. And he was saying like, you know, you like, even though that's how you and like that's how you saw it before he was like you can still interpret it a different way and use it for good and so I'm trying to do that because it's it still is a struggle because <laughs> it's even just like the simple verses I don't even know just anything it's like I just am taken back to like a sermon or whatever and it's just like it just makes me mad <laughs> and it's just it, it's like hard to like I guess just not think like that still um but yeah that's all <laughs> yeah really appreciate your your honesty I think that's I think that's real and um like I said um in that conversation I'll say again because I think there's people that can relate that you know, sometimes that is a part of healing from some of that stuff is that even, even the smallest verse, you know, can trigger feelings and memories that are really harmful. Um, and so it's a grace um, to be able to work through that and walk alongside people who also have been harmed by some of these things. So be patient with yourself. Um, I'll continue on that theme of like kind of anger the the scripture passage you read and it always helps me because you offer me a different perspective um, when I've read that before God saying I see my people suffering I'm like they've been suffering for hundreds of years <laughs> did you do something about it before yeah and you know, God's 
God's uh, will is always a mystery, or not always, but often a very mystery and timing. Um, and I think of, you know, people looking at, at, at that scripture who were enslaved, you know, that that might be offering help, hope that even though there was a long time of suffering, God did redeem. Um, I personally have been struggling the more I read um, different perspectives and things that are happening in the world. Um, it's so easy to get discouraged about um, the state of our, in the country, as far as laws being passed, not to, not to teach um, anything that's going to make one race feel shame or guilt. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> how did we get here? Or um, recently in the news, the Tesla factories being in California is being accused of, I mean, horrendous things. And I'm thinking, if that's happening, how many other places is this happening? And I'm just not, we're just not aware of it, you know, that races are being segregated and um, being punished for bringing things to people's attention. So when you said, how is God rising up? You know, I, I'm, I'm struggling to see how God is rising up. I'm, 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 I'm so grateful for so many things um, that I personally have been blessed with. And yet, um, why is it that I have so many blessings and others don't, you know? Um, it certainly isn't because of me and what I've done. I mean, so thank you for, you know, clarifying some things, but also um, helping me reflect more. Mm -hmm. so thank you. Yeah, thank you, Carol. I appreciate that. I think that that is, an appropriate response to a lot of this. I think my hope is that um, sometimes it would just bring up more questions because we're still in the midst of this. Um, and so I, I really appreciate your honesty because I'm, I'm also there with you. Like <laughs> another sermon could be like, I wish we still had the God of Exodus, <laughs> you know, like where is that God? <laughs> um, and so I think that that's very real and I think there's space for that too. It's a lot to think about. Abby, I wanted to just say that that is such an impressive um, exercise seems like not a sufficient enough word, but process that you're going through um, and, and working on that. Like, I, I want to think about that, um, about doing that. Um, but, and to, to um, Terrell and what Brooke was saying about us being part of Instead of an individual faith, the, that heartache that you feel, that frustration that you feel, I think is from that sense of the bigger community, right? Of, of wanting the best and equality for the bigger community. And that's why it's so hard versus just, you know, hunkering down and being in, your, in our own <clears throat> faith, in our own, you know, experience. Mm -hmm. That's what makes it hard for some of us. Our community, our, our church community compared to maybe the ones that Brooke, you talked about that the emphasis is not on that. Thank you, Brooke, for a great message again. Every week, you bring us a message that we all need to hear. I wish that I wish that every white church could hear your message. I wish that every white person in my neighborhood could hear your message. Mm 
because I, I think I spent so many years not knowing and not understanding. I was so glad that you mentioned that part about the Bible where they, they tore a piece of the Bible up of, of Exodus for because they didn't want the slaves to know that it, it could be for them. And um, I, I didn't know that till I went to the Bible Museum four or five years ago. And when I saw that, I just could not believe the lies that white people have been told about Christianity for so many years. And they were lies and they were intentional. And they've been intentional. And that's the most disturbing thing to me, to think that people intentionally could try to keep God away from anybody, no matter who they are. So just thank you today. You give me a lot to think about, Brooke. Mm. And I just want to tell you, I love you. Mm. <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> thank you, Judy. I, I appreciate that a lot. Um, yeah, I think a lot of people don't know some of those things. Um, ripping out pages and, and keeping certain parts away from people um, parallels a lot of the things that are happening in terms of like mm -hmm. how we want to tell history and what we want people to know. It's still with us in a lot of ways. Um, but I'm grateful for you all to be having these reflections. I think that's at least part of it. <laughs>